planted a, a chunk of that in um, Sorghum Sudan for, for our bucks, just as an experiment. Um, but for the most part, I'm trying to, uh, I'll seed in some um, Johnson grass, but mostly just, just the cool season annuals. Um, with goats, it is beneficial because they, they love trees, so I'm thinning woods. So I'll just take, it's, I start the chainsaw and they come running. I have to push them away. <laughs> so we do have that. It's yeah. kind of like my warm season. If we did have a drought, last year we had a bad drought. So I was taking down um, sassafras and sycamore, just some trees that I want to thin out. But for the most part, other than that, sorghum and some Johnson grass, and it's mostly a cool season. So they they actually prefer Johnson grass as well. Oh, they love Johnson grass. All livestock do. Yeah. They they will say you never see Johnson grass in a field. You see it on the fence row. Yeah. That's because it's yeah. the one it's one grass goats will kill. They'll eat it down to the ground, and cows will. Now I know that in the winter time you have to or well first frost you have to be concerned with the uh, the uh, niacin. Yeah, for the about niacin. two weeks. Yes. Yeah. yeah so that's, that's, that could yeah. cause them as well. <laughs> yeah. Same with sorghum. Usually mm -hmm. warm season grasses yeah. after a frost, you have to wait two weeks. Mm -hmm. Or after, any time there's a quick growth, too, after a drought, because mm -hmm. of nitrate. Um, the good thing about goats, as far as uh, poisonous forage, is since goats are browsers, they never, they're not like sheep and cows, they'll just kind of mow, as they pick here, pick there, pick there. So anytime you're in a pasture situation, there's always going to be poisonous plants. But for the most part, they'll never take in enough mm -hmm. to actually hurt themselves. The theory is, with all livestock, is that they seek out the most nutritious part of the plant. <coughs> and um, especially as browsers, that's what goats are doing, and it's why they browse. Mm -hmm. So I guess you had to do the same with the Johnson grass, because they might avoid it knowing that, that there's something that they really, really don't need in it. Okay. But we haven't had a problem with any um, toxicity or anything like that. Okay. There's an interesting thing, um, just for general livestock knowledge, there's a plant around here called white snake root. I don't know if you ever found with that with your sheep. So it's supposedly, what it causes, it causes milk sickness. That was a bigger problem in pioneer times. Supposedly what killed Abraham Lincoln's mom. Um, and we have a slew of it. So I got really scared. Called uh, the USDA point, uh, Poisonous Plant Lab in Logan, Utah. Found a guy that's all he studies is white snake root. And he was saying, he's like, I cannot believe that the FDA is not getting on this stuff. I said, can I send you samples? He said, where are you? I said, Athens County. He said, oh, I said, he traveled around. He said, I got samples from Zanesville however many years ago, and it turned out to be non-toxic in your area, but send me some samples. So I sent him two samples out the year, and he said it, it, it's not toxic in our area. You sent samples of the plant? Of the white snake group, yeah. The whole part. Some of them are. Some of them are. There's one or two that just hammer it. <laughs> we have it. Here, oh, yeah, it's all over. Yeah. But he said both ones. Both samples sent, sand, there was no toxicity. He said Ohio and Indiana, the yeah, samples in general soil. He doesn't, he said They I haven't know. identified what the actual toxin yeah, is. They just know the patterns, that when they see like this pattern, it doesn't correlate with toxicity. Mm -hmm. And that when they see these other patterns, it does. And right. it's cumulative, right? Like yeah, that. it's cumulative, yeah. Is it soil? <laughs> he said he doesn't know. Yeah, the worst place is Carbondale, Illinois. So don't drink milk from a small farm. <laughs> there are small farms there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you, you mentioned milk pooling. Yeah, they, yeah, that's why that's why it's kind of no one worries. But he said FDA doesn't worry about it because milk is all pooled right. nowadays. So it comes from big farms, even if they are pastured farms, but with a small farm. Doing that for 50, 60 years. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned Russian olive. How much did we got? And, and there's a reason why I asked. Isn't that one of the plants that the state has just banned to sale of? Yes. Oh yeah, it's a natural. Autumn name. olive. Name. Yeah, autumn. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's I tried to propagate the autumn olive. Okay, yeah, I misspoke autumn olive. Yeah, I tried to propagate it, but <laughs> they girdle it so they'll leave the bark and kill it, and then if any, as soon as the shoot is up, you know, four inches, they they take it down. Yeah, all the plants goats like are illegal. Johnson grass, I can't buy seed. Um, kudzu, they love kudzu. Can't get that. Um, Have you got kudzu on the farm? No, I'd like to. Yeah. Larry Tyree Larry said he has something near his area. It's so. in here. <laughs> Are you there's, guys no, there's some on Peach Ridge Road. Road. That's Is it gonna, like, are you able to manage the crushed or you can continue? I think so. Eat it? I think so. Out at some point and just have grass. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's a challenge. They generally say you don't want to eat more than 50% of the leaf matter um, at any one time. 
but browse takes longer to rest than, than grass does. So I don't know. I mean, hopefully, um, I constantly move them don't leave in one spot. And they say the bigger the paddock, the better, because they won't focus on like one automatic plant or one berry plant. Um, but yeah, that's also, I think, a challenge, too, with, with rotation of grazing goats, is we might eventually have to move to sheep. So we're, I'm always in the back of my mind, I'm calling sheep breeders. Um, there's like six in the country who have sheep, or dairy sheep, but that, that'd be another way to move it. As the land changes, um, the browse does go away, and we move to something that is more, more of a grass. So what's your afternoons like? <clears throat> you said you, you, do the, you do the maintenance of the goats in the morning, and then you do your processing and mm -hmm. everything like that. So what's your afternoons like? <coughs> Oh, well, it just depends on the season. Um, milking takes about an hour, clean up another half an hour, and then pasteurizing if, if we're making a product. Um, then leave, leave in, that, in that time too is leading them to their pasture. Um, clipping pastures, you can see in this picture, uh, to the far left of the field, that was clipped. You see the clipping, the grass is shorter than the taller, so I'll clip pastures um, to try to even out the, so it grows back quicker, so things like that. Um, maintenance, you know, everything's breaking. Sure, sure. So, cleaning. In addition to processing, it's like one day you process and then the next day you put the package Package and label. So packaging and labeling. Uh-huh. Takes a few hours a day too. Yeah, and endless cleaning. The stainless steel and things like that. So what's your day before market like? Is it pretty low stress, or is it you ramping up a lot? To no, I think it's. I think with at least for us, I don't know about it with with your sheep. It's different, I think, than a than a, a produce farm where you're harvesting everything the day before. Where we're our products throughout the whole week. We're you know making chefs one day, yogurt another day, uh, fat another day. So it's it's not all on Friday that I have to harvest all the kale and tomatoes. So so I think it, it's. It's um, kind of spaced out more throughout the week. Yeah. How about for you? Is that? I just pack, get up early in the morning, pack up my cooler, check all my meat. Uh -huh. I, every two weeks, we're butchering. The week after, we go and we get it's all processed, and uh -huh. uh, I bring it home, start in the freezers, and then you know, just Saturday morning, pack it all up and uh -huh. haul it all in. Yeah. That's it. That's it. A lot of moving up fences too. Yeah, so always the moving fences. Once you get the goats where they're going to be that day, you move the fence or where they'll be the next day. So uh -huh. that after milking, it just goes right up. Mm -hmm. What kind of charges do you guys use? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, just I, I when I was starting this too, I called Bill Dix, the guy from Snow Milk, and I said, I said, Bill, what kind of charger should I get? And he said, the most expensive one you can afford. <laughs> um, <coughs> and it's important with goats. I, I use just it's a Ken Cove, 23 Jewel. Um, so it's hot, yeah. Um, and that's because I mean it's, you know, we some our fence is six strands, so there's hundreds of miles of fence to consider. Um, that's an important thing with with the goats is like so we can hold them with three strands, but they have to be extremely hot because they'll and touch with their nose, and if it's not hot, they're through it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're herd animals; they get through it and they turn around. And like, wait, why am I here? And the herd's over there. <laughs> they all, they all go. Yeah. Well, usually there's only a few that tend to kind of go through, um, but they never go far. So yeah, we just they're really keeping it. And my fencing philosophy has been a process of elimination. Um, the first fence I built for the goats was around our garden. It's like seven strands of high pencil. It was just ridiculous. Now. Now four or five strands, so just constantly trying to what I can get with, the littlest I can get away with in fencing because fencing is so pricey and labor intensive, especially on um, really rough ground. Um, you don't have a predator problem? No, not at all. No, we. And I don't know if this is the case. I was told that coyotes have paths, and if you're not on a coyote path, you just happen to look out. We hear them. I don't know how far away they are. We also bring them into the barn at yeah, night. Yeah, and then the second thing is we bring them into the they're, barn at night. They're, you know, a couple hundred, two hundred yards from the house. Sure. And with a dog that stays outside the dog, yeah. all night. Right, right. But no, we've lucked out with that. We have foxes, but I mean, they don't. Yeah, that's the same thing. The goats are, I don't know about with the sheep, but they're fairly aggressive. 
like if a if a dog, an unfamiliar dog, comes at them, they well they'll get up hard. Yeah. yeah they, oh, when our dog first went into the herd, they just knocked her into the into the fence. Gee. Yeah. So they're pretty aggressive animals. Right. I right. think especially when their kids are around. Yeah. But no, luckily no coyotes. Do you have coyote issues or? No. Well, we haven't. Um, but you know we. Uh, we keep like like you would keep a good charge, and then uh, we use um, uh, all the premier nets. Oh yeah. So it's forty eight inches and it's nine strand. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll we'll get through that. Yes, and then we have two Pyrenees, one that stays in with the main flock. Well, yeah. what I consider the most vulnerable, and then we have. Uh, the, the guy who stays on the outside, uh -huh. so it works pretty, pretty good. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, but our, when we had our goats, I remember our goats were um, pretty. They 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 did a pretty good job as far as themselves. So. Uh -huh. so. How many goats have you got? Average. We have right now um, twenty-seven ewes and three bucks. Use I see uh does. I know which one. Does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully quite good. Yeah. And we really don't need three bucks, but um we just I brought eye replacements and haven't shed the the older ones. You generally want to keep a buck for about five years, they say. Um, and that I think <coughs> I initially thought we could have forty does, forty milking does, but again with the concerns about the brows. And the biggest, I think, for growth with small ruminants, I don't know what you think, Brian, is parasites, is um, managing for barber pole worm, which is the big parasite. If you guys are any meeting on a sheep or goats, it's always going to come up. You'll hear about that. So it's just minute, the stocking density. Um, I think probably would be around 30 for our farm. Um, just with the land and also just how many I feel like I can manage in milk and the amount of milk we can, can process in that market. How do you um, so, handle barber pole? Uh, that's a good question. I think rotating animals is the, is the biggest thing for me. And having a long, they say ideally you want 60 them to be off a of, paddock for 60 days is ideal. Um, 30 days is good too, and our rotations are 33 days. Um, hmm. And then just keeping a close eye, there's a thing called FAMACHA. It's an acronym, and you're just looking at um, their eye to see if they're anemic because barber pole causes anemia, the worm that lives in their stomach. And then we also collect fecal samples, look under a microscope and count the worm eggs. Um, so we do that. Um, if, an, if, I look at, if I look at an animal and she's looking kind of thin or thinner than I wanted to be, we'll, I'll check her a fecal sample. And that's how we, if we worm or not worm. <coughs> and what they really want to, uh, folks who study stuff, really want to minimize using the dewormers because of resistance. Mm -hmm. And we want to minimize it too because I want to be medicating animals and that milk is no good for X amount of time if they're on medication. So like I said, we've so far not had to deal with, with too much of it. We've had a few incidents of meningeal worm, which is a really bizarre parasite that is carried in deer and um, goes for an aberrant host and it gets into their gut and climbs into their brain, and they have neurological problems. We've got a few with that, but they've been fine treating them, and it's pretty easy to pick up. But luckily, no major parasite. Do you milk uh, year round, or are you able to dry them up? Yeah, goats are, it's a good question. Yeah, goats are um, seasonal breeders. So just like deer, they'll go into rut and heat in the fall. And so we'll breed them in the fall and they have a five month gestation. And they'll kid in, um, we'll kid around mid March. And they milk them for eight or nine months. And they should have 60, at least 60 days of rest. So um, some of the big dairies, like Redwood Hills, what you see in the pharmacy, they have their yogurt, they're all over. Their confinement, so they manipulate with lights. So they can change their, um, their the estrus cycles. But no, we, yeah, so we'll milk from March till around Christmas and then dry them up. Which presents a marketing issue. Um, there, we, uh, 
step one of those three of uh, farming processing and marketing processing is uh, just adding new cheeses that can be um, aged or shed that can be frozen to have some cheese throughout the, throughout the winter time. Um, but again, that's a, a, another challenge with goats, because on the cows, like I said, they're seasonal, seasonal breeders. Can you talk about the, um, what was it called, the animal welfare approved yeah. um, certification? Is that, have you compared that to, say, OFA, organic certification, what the cost difference is? Or mm -hmm. what the yeah. <coughs> well, animal welfare approved, there's no cost. Oh. Because they don't want there to be a conflict of interest. Oh. Um, so yeah, they, um, the audit is completely free. All their information, everything is free. We pay a nominal fee for the labels that we put. But yeah, there's, there's no cost at all. It is, it's not an organic certification. Um, they do push. I mean, they, they'll talk to us about it. They repeat speed since we're so, like I said, we don't, our, our grass is organic. Um, but their focus is more on pasture. That's, they are, um, But they're uh, not pushing, but encouraging. Encouraging, yeah. The organization. It's uh, it's called the Greener World. Is like the the, the nonprofit that runs it, and um, their the mission statement, I guess, is what I was looking for, is to increase pasture farming. They still work with big farms and farm small farms like us. Um, so yeah, so there's no cost. It's completely voluntary. It's a once a year audit. Um, Someone will come out. Um, they give some some notice. And the one you know, health records, fee records, fee tags, mineral tags, will walk, they measure things. Birthing weights, birthing records. Birthing weights, records. How often do you comfortably bring that? We have to track every animal we sell, who we sell it to. Um, the purpose of the animals. Yeah, they want. It's a really um, in depth transportation. We have to have a transportation um, plan. What happens if, you know, what kind of We are. They, they, uh, there's animal welfare crew slaughterhouses. We called every slaughterhouse in the area, and no one wanted anything to do with it. Um, so they technically we couldn't slaughter animals in the slaughterhouse. They make exemptions if we were a, a meat operation. Um, but really, all they it's <coughs> they wouldn't require anything about the slaughterhouse. They just like to have someone come in and observe and just give pointers. Um, but it's been a great thing for us. I think it's a great organization, and I, it's. Like they're very knowledgeable people, and I think it's been beneficial to our business. Um, I think with animal welfare approved versus like an organic standard, the emphasis is on the well-being of the animal, the animal doing what is natural to that animal. So like our uh, layers are also part of our animal welfare approved, and so you could, especially now with the laws changed with egg production, you could market something as organic. But it doesn't mean that that animal is doing what is at all natural or healthy for that animal. It means that you know, if the cow gets sick, you move her out of the organic herd and put her in the conventional herd, um, or that you wouldn't treat the animal with antibiotics. Um, versus in the animal welfare food model, the goal is to promote preventive care, health. Um, they promote herbal or non-medicinal treatments, that's the first treatment, and then say that ultimately the same as you would do with a person in those rare occasions where an antibiotic could be life-saving, that, that would be the treatment, understanding that that milk is pulled from you know any consumption of people. Which is state law, too. State law, yeah. And we test every batch. Um, but versus like organic eggs, you can technically have the animal not even ever outside. Um, so that's where this seems more like when people are buying organic, I think they think that what they're getting is what animal welfare approved is saying, but it's not really accurate. I think some of the standards for animal welfare approved are much more global about how does this work on this individual farm has the impact of the people. I mean, even as far as like employee sorts of things, like how, are, how does this affect the health of the people who are taking care of the animal? Um, then making plans for emergencies, and we have to have emergency preparedness plans for 
if there were a flood, if there were a fire, if there are temperatures of a certain degree, you know, too hot, too cold for a prolonged period of time, what's the plan, how would we manage it? Um, what else? Yeah. But I think it's, yeah, I feel like it's more involved, but I've never gone through an organic you know, livestock sort of approval. So who pays the auditor? It's a nonprofit, so they rely on donations. The so they oh, pay the they auditor. Pay, oh yes, yes, yeah. The auditors are independent. Um, like most of them are vet, veterinarians. I think that just as a side gig, they do this and they travel around to different farms. And a greener world is the this large nonprofit. It's, in, it's always in Europe and Canada, and they they pay the auditor. Oh, biosecurity. That's the other thing that they don't. Oh, biosecurity. Yeah. Certified organic auditors are private contractors too. Yeah, so that'd be the same thing. Yeah, private contractors. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. Yeah. But yeah, it's just been it's been I think a benefit um, as far as our marketing and as far as just um, a knowledge base. I think um, uh, it's it's so important that I can talk to other farmers, and I think that's that's. I've learned a lot of just talking to other farmers here and, and elsewhere. <coughs> and it's just one opportunity to talk to people who are kind of in the business and, and farming the way we are. We see a lot of farms. Yeah. yeah. Big and small. So it's, it's, it's been great. But what's been some of your marketing struggles? Um, marketing? <laughs> I'm, I'm not a good marketer. But, uh, you know, I, I, first off, I would say that not a struggle, but the farmer's market's so great. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, a great market. I mean, when I talk to folks who are in other markets, even in bigger cities, where you think there'd be a larger population base, it seems like they have a more difficult time. Um, so for me, I guess the struggle is, is just doing it. Like, handing somebody something and accepting money um, is, is not, isn't, is difficult. Um, but I think it's kind of creating a, I don't even like these words. I'm like creating a brand or creating like, what am I selling? You know, I mean, because a lot of people don't even know what Chev is or, or, uh, or Feta or, you know, it's so it's creating that and right. figuring out like, what are we doing? Kind of what are we selling? Right. And so I think that's what, where that and what for approved is, has helped us because it kind of created a philosophy for who we are as a farm. So to enable to sell that brand of, of what, of what we're doing. There was an interesting discussion that I, I was looking at the other day. Um, musicians were questioning Spotify and really pinning them down. What is your product? And, uh -huh. and the people who run Spotify were saying, Spotify is our product. Spotify is not a product. If everybody knows what Spotify is. It's a, it's a music thing that you go to and you can get music from the sun. They don't pay sufficient enough to the musicians who develop the music and so on and so forth. The people who started Spotify were saying Spotify itself is their product. It's not a product, wherein you have an actual product. Uh -huh. There's something you can put in your hand and, and it's more than just a service, which is what things like Spotify are. Um, it, it's, it's a better thing that you've got an actual product that you've got uh -huh. to sell. And, and I see your, your, your pain about you're not really a salesperson. You no. Want to, you want to be farming, you don't want to be selling. Yeah, food. exactly. I can understand that because that's uh -huh. a whole different kind of approach to life. Yeah. And it's interesting selling food. I remember Henry two weeks ago, uh, when he was produce talk, said about uh, flour. Some people, like, without a thought, pay thousands for flour. At the market, people will not even flinch to buy soap for six dollars a bar. They're like, oh, oh yeah, you know, whatever. And, but cheese or or yogurt, or mushrooms, or eggs, kind of like, oh, four dollars? I'm like, these eggs will keep you alive for a week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll go into Kroger's and spend six dollars on a cup of coffee. Yes. And they question, you know, three, four dollars for a dozen eggs. Yeah, so pricing is a challenge, too, of what, um, I mean, there's other things I know what I need to make to make it viable to do it, but then what is it going to, how much is it, what price will it sell? But the beauty of the farmer's market, too, is we all kind of just bounce those ideas off each other. So, like, within your business plan, you know, you, you were talking early on about how it's, a, it's a, um, a more holistic approach. It's how you live your life on the farm and that. So, have you 
in your marketing, in your product, getting your product out, do you think that you've reached your outer limit and you're happy with where you are in terms of your milk production, your work schedule, or are you looking at, I want to, I'd like to get my product out a little bit further, I'd like to push it out to maybe a couple of markets up in Columbus or, you know, other places are, are you, is that something that you're considering or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think to a degree we are very happy with um, selling food to people we have a relationship with. That's what I like the most, um, is that interaction. That to me is the most satisfying. So as long as that is economically viable, that's what I want to be doing. We had toy, I talked with, with Becky Rondi at Green Edge about um, getting on their truck, taking things to Columbus. And it, at that point, it, we, 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 let me back up and say, we sell almost everything that we produce. So we're lucky right now. We've hit a size where almost everything we make turns into money. But um, I thought, oh, it'd be nice to get on Becky's truck. And I thought, I don't, I don't know if that's where we're going. Um, so there's other going up, I don't know if I'm going to go in that direction in Columbus and selling to people I don't have a relationship with. And again, I don't have relationships with these people, but I'm looking at selling at OU at some of their markets, things like that. Um, and yeah, I, I had mentioned when Henry's was here of, of maybe if we could somehow get a collaborative of different farmers going and going to the Granville Market or going to Clintonville. <coughs> um, so maybe go in that direction at farmers markets. But I think it's I think for small farmers, it's very important to have a as much of your hands in your selling and have a relationship with the people who are buying your food. Because if someone at the market asks me a question of how I do things, I can answer it. I can tell them. You know, I can say, you can come to the farm and you're welcome to come and see or do whatever. And I think that's really important to small farming. And I think the more small farmers kind of um, try to spread too far, it kind of, we're losing, I think, the mission of or lo losing what we, the advantage we have over the big commodity farmers. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I don't know if that answers your question so much. Is that as much as I can, I want to stay, stay around here. Um, and a lot of it, again, it's, it's a holistic thing. It's dictated by what our land will produce, how much forage it will produce, how healthy our animals are, how much they're producing, how much I can physically process. I mean, our pasture is only so big. Um, so all those come into, and then the other thing is how much can we sell. So it all is, kind of, is, is related. Right, right. If that, if that makes sense. In, if you ever get too big, I know that you probably, your aged cheeses can, has a lot to grow. Yeah, that's another. So that's yeah. right there, putting putting that excess milk, if you have it, into an aged cheese. Exactly. You know, six yeah. months down the way, mm -hmm. that would be something you can sell <coughs> to us, for sure. Yeah, and that's something we're developing, too. Is, <laughs> Please. <laughs> just, we just built in, in a, a small aging facility, yeah. and um, similar to what... I think you guys were here on the Henry's first talk with a cool bot. It's a great little technology. If you guys are ever interested in building either for produce or for um, any kind of product, a cool, cool bot. It's a, they have a great website. Um, so we built an aging facility and I'm just kind of experimenting with, with that stuff. Did you already talk about, um, or would you share, like the startup costs, not yeah. counting land, and, mm -hmm. but just equipment? Yes. Of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that building in the foreground there is that's where we milk and process. We milk on the right in the open area and process on the left. <coughs> it's 30 by 20. There's a hayloft on top. The building itself was, for all the materials, um, including the concrete, which we hired out, was about $5,000. Um, so that inexpensive. The big hit for a small dairy is you have to have a pasteurizer. Now, when we were starting off, there were two options. Um, that the, the head guy from the state came down and he said, you can buy a couple thousand dollar kettle cooker. That'd be really inexpensive. You can get them online, there's tons of them all over. But he's like, lucky you're gonna have to do a lot of modifications to it. Um, you have to buy a sharp, a sharp recorder, which would be another thousand dollars. Or we can buy a new, uh, new pasteurizer. We chose to do that. It sells around $11,000. So that's an inexpensive investment right there. Um, the reason I chose to do that was the guy who made it delivered it. It came with a chart recorder, and it works. 
You know, I can dial in the number, the temperature I want it to go to. It heats the milk to that. Um, it's very energy efficient. I'm not. I mean, the thermometers are in there. The state comes and tests my thermometers every single time. They're spot on. So I think that was a, a great investment. There are a lot of things that require constant maintenance. Yeah. There and so having one less thing that you have to worry about because it's a money loss if you have gallons and gallons of milk that you have to dump, or if you have to have multiple days of working on mm -hmm. a machine that. Yeah. If you're not familiar with or trying to figure it out. So the pasteurizer was the big thing. We, um, it is legal to hand milk, but we use milkers, um, just bucket milkers. We have two, those are $400 each. Um, and so you need a vacuum system. We have a really inexpensive vacuum, which is a portable vacuum system that I have up in the AWOF, um, which was around, was around $1,100. Uh, it just runs off a one-time uh, circuit. <coughs> so as far as milking, that was the big equipment. Thing. There were chillers and stainless steel. Oh, everything. stainless steel. Think, but that you can, 20. for all the, equi all the equipment, probably all the milking equipment in that building was around 20. Yeah. So, Paul, if you feel comfortable, could you talk more about just even getting to the land and yeah. the, in your guys' personal life, how it, how it worked to get to where you are now? Yeah. Do you mean in the, finances, in the financial re respects of things? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I guess for me personally is I um, had the goal, from the time I was younger, had a goal of farming. Um, and a lot of my family had bigger farms. Um, <coughs> and um, in Pennsylvania, my, uh, my grandpa's farm was a, a, a big farm, and I knew that financially was not going to be feasible. I mean, I wasn't going to inherit land or... So it was just... A, um, I took it as... Uh, my tact was to learn as much as I can. So working on different farms, I've worked on almost every farm here in Athens County. Um, and as I was doing that, I realized working on these farms, I was not going to be able to afford to buy a farm. Um, so I uh, thought, what job can I have where I can make decent money and um, but still be able to focus on farming? So I went to nursing school. Uh, Worked as a nurse for a while and saved enough money to, to buy this farm. <coughs> um, and like I said, this place had been abandoned for 35 years. There was um, a rundown house and five or six rundown barns. But we got it really inexpensively um, for that reason. So um, if you don't mind getting into a little detail, like yeah. what was like per acre, what would you say? How much your, cost? Yeah. yeah, $1,100 an acre. Okay. Um, which is that's, that's a steal. ridiculous cheap. Now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now even more so. We bought it in 2010. Um, but again, it took it took a lot of work. You know, we, we tore, down the tore down the house and then the and then built all the and then <coughs> um, So for I, I, there's a lot of ways to to go. Through, and I know uh, yeah, Henry answered the, a similar question. Um, but for me, it was just a process of not also not wanting to go into debt. So just figuring out how financially how how can can I swing it at that point? Um, and now I farm full time because I wanted. Then it was like, how can I get the business to a point where it makes sense? <coughs> and the way I view it is, um, I mean, we are married, two of us, we don't have kids. So I think the business I want to be able to, could we live on what we make on the farm? And we, I I wanted to get to that point before I stopped having another job. So I take it seeing that in our previous conversation you've made it to that point. Yeah. Uh-huh. Marginally. Yeah. That's what fair. Yeah. I have the job and insurance. Oh yeah, and insurance. Yeah. So it's a lot of yeah, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um but I think we've we gotten to a point where I would be comfortable if I were a single person living on what I make. I wouldn't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. But I would be happy with 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 what I'm doing. But I think in I mean, I think vegetable farming is probably a little bit different because the capital costs aren't as high as, as livestock, as far as what you need to get started. Yeah, startup costs, for sure. But then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you reach a point where if you can't sell all that stuff locally, then you have things like, are you going to buy a refrigerated truck? Yeah. Are you going to spend, you know, 15 hours once a week in a truck? Like, yeah. You know, are you going to drive 200 miles a week to uh -huh. sell produce? Because if it's not, I mean, if it doesn't all go away here, yeah, there can be, you know, 
a decent refrigerated truck costs a lot more than a pasteurized. Yeah. Know. But, and it's always going to break. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, initial startup costs, aside from the fact that in Athens County there's not a whole lot of suitable vegetable production land. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, initial capital costs are significantly less. Uh -huh. so. <coughs> An important thing I wanted to do too, what you're saying with the, the trick with the refrigerated truck is it's a refrigerated truck. If you're not hauling things you need, need to cool and it's not really worth much. Right. Other than the pasteurizer, I wanted everything we had to be able to be used for something else as well. So all of our buildings, if this wasn't working, all my goats died, I could turn it into a, a vegetable production. That building can be, I mean, I, so I can chill, it's where I can process, so I can make the barns a barn. So everything. She's, she's aging room becomes a refrigerator. A refrigerator, a walk-in walk cooler. So everything, it was ideally a multi-purpose. Um, so would you say one of the biggest advantages and when you're going to, so was, you had forethought of what ifs? Yes. And ch and so you so you, when you look at your finances, you are looking at what's the most bang for my buck, and the sense of worst case scenarios. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's probably in any business. There's always the thoughts of worst worst case scenarios and what do I do if if um, if X Y and Z mm -hmm. don't work? Because there's always been something that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, we had um, initially we started out put in like about a thousand raspberry plants, and they were going gangbusters, looking great. And I knew I chose a bad field, but it was flat. It was very good soil, which is odd for this area. I mean, it, high pH, great organic matter. Um, and then they flooded. And then, the soil so good. Yeah, the soil so good. <laughs> exactly. And they just died. You know, so there's always going to be some. The blackberries did fine, mm -hmm. so they're going gangbusters. But in some of the red, I, mean, I moved some of the raspberries. But you know, there's always a there's always something that always goes wrong. Mm -hmm. I guess I was looking at more with the sense of like somebody who's living on a shoestring. Yeah. Um, what would they? I mean, some of the things to really look at is, and I, I, you seem to have thought about in those contexts. So I guess more of like a detail as to like what was your process when you went through the detail. Okay, right. I've gone through these farms. I've learned this stuff. Uh -huh. What really kind of when you start looking at this this acreage, what were the initial kind of official things you were thinking of? That helped you decide to get where you are now, like those key yeah. pros yeah. and cons. Um, I, I think the important thing, and this is me, this is just my personality, was to have a secure income, and that's why I chose the route that I did to start to start a business. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a difficult thing to do. Farming is a difficult, I mean, as it is running. The, any small business, it's difficult to do as a, as a sole income. I think agriculture is very hard. I mean, look at the statistics, there's very few full-time farmers in this country. Even the people we call like the big guys often have another family member or another source of income just because it's a difficult, mm -hmm. um, just because of high investment. Um, so I, I knew starting the business that, that there, you know, the, the two of us, one of us would have to have another for just for health insurance alone, but for me, it was having another source of. <laughs> I mean, we were building all the stuff. I was still working full time. We were buying animals because I knew that I needed year and a half, and a half of the business um, because it was just those costs, and I, we, we didn't have we didn't care farm, didn't have family help, didn't you know? It was just what we had is what we were working with. So that was just an important thing for me was to be able to to have that security of getting that started. Mm -hmm. And I know in um, even if there's that, you mentioned that Salmon book, You Can Farm. Right. And he even talks about that in there, too. I mean, he's like, oh, like, so I remember he's saying, substitute teach, do things like that, just to get a business going. Mm -hmm. it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to get started. With all your planning and all your preparation, what did you forget? What did I forget? What did you forget to think about that all of a sudden you discovered somewhere down the Oh, that's oh, a long God. list. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, with our with the um, milking facility, I mean, there's a lot of mistakes in there. The state prescribes exactly how they want it done, and I jumped the gun and did a few things before I knew what they wanted done. Like they want they want the cove where the wall hits the floor to have a certain angle, and my angles are all wrong. So there's things like that, but it's clean. So the infrastructure, 
I'd recommend like if you're doing anything that has regulations, it's just talking and getting that stuff out right away. Um, and just have made a lot of that, I think just general fencing and livestock errors. I think that there are some things that we were definitely trying to keep costs really low yeah. when first starting and then realized like and again it's hindsight and when you know everything turns out okay and the business works and that it's funny, like financially stable then you can look back and be like, why didn't we spend the extra two thousand dollars? That wouldn't have been a big deal, it would have helped a lot. But it would have saved a lot more. It would have saved a lot of time now. So I think there are some of those little things that you just didn't know until you start your own dairy that it would have been worth it mm -hmm. or paying somebody to excavate versus just like Yeah. I don't know, being like, yeah, well, let's spend it. Uh -huh. And I think I would have, and I still can, but started off with more um, with some sheep to have a diverse livestock, have a um, more diversity in the livestock. I think that would have been, been smart to do, um, just with what Kale was asking. Just with um, even if we still have grouse, but to utilize our our forage better. I mean, the goats will trample a lot of grass that they won't eat. Where if we had sheep in there, they'd be eating that too. Um, so I think that would, would be a smart thing to, to look into. What's your water source on the farm? Yeah, good question. We have, um, for processing, we use Liax water. Mm -hmm. um, the state really likes that. Mm -hmm. um, for the goats, oh well. Um, just a, a shallow well for their water. And I know that your farm's name is Leading Creek, or Creekside Farms, because there is a creek. Do you yeah. utilize that that resource? Mm -hmm. um, no, it's uh, it runs all year, but it would be it's pretty shallow. It'd be hard to pump from. Mm -hmm. The great thing about goats, um, well, yeah, they produce less milk than cows, but they drink. I mean, their their water needs are very minimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're and uh, with our system, another nice thing about this uh, micro dairy designs the guy who built our pasteurizer, is we can recycle all the water I pasteurize with. I use that water for cleaning. So, I mean, we use very little water. We've never been over the minimum of Liax with our household and our business. Because hmm. it's so easy to recycle, because the system is so neat, so I can recycle water so easily. <coughs> so yeah, Liax and the well. If we didn't have Liax, they, we'd have to have EPA tests of all of our water continually. Um, so, it was, it was there. question yeah. going back to the uh, taking the goat to the slaughterhouse. Uh -huh. Do you do you do that? I mean, we, do you have goat meat? Yeah, we, we oh no no we, we a, yeah good question. We haven't found a market. So it the cheapest we found was seventy dollars um, flat fee for however big the goat is. Um, and you know if we're bringing a goat you get about thirty five percent. Um, return on meat, so it just wasn't. There's a few people selling goat meat at the market for now, but they're all saying it's it's just not worth it. So no, so we don't have any legal goat meat. We butcher ourselves. That, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so we slaughter and butcher our own for our own consumption for friends and the neighborhood and things like that. Um, the Thanksgiving goat. The Thanksgiving goat. <laughs> but I would like that to be a better market because I think that'd be a good way to utilize our weathers that we do leave on the does. Um, but from the folks, Jeff Brock at High Bottom, he sells goat meat and he stopped. He's like, it's just not, it doesn't make any sense economically. We've had a few inquiries about folks coming out to the farm like to do halal slaughter. Yeah, that's what it's just And I think Pete Shu did that for a while with his sheep. And he, he said it worked out great for him. I haven't gone in that direction, direction yet. A, according to our AWA certification, we cannot do halal slaughter. The animal has to be stunned prior to slaughter. So that would, but they do do exceptions um, there. But yeah, so other, we otherwise we just haven't found it economically viable. But I would like to figure out a way to to utilize that resource. So, <clears throat> so how do you kill your goats? We uh, I have a captive bull. Oh, it's Stunner, um, just a handheld one. Um, I don't know how, which one, it, and it just sends a bolt in it, their insensate it's instantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's penetrating. Okay. <laughs> and they're insensate instantly, and then we just. It's, 
super fast. Yeah. Reliable. Oh yeah. Yeah, we use and they're instantaneously down. Um, so what's the life cycle of, uh, let's say, a doe? Like on your farm, how long do they live? What's their lifespan? You, oh, I mean, they could live they, up to 16 or 18 years. You generally want to stop breeding after eight years, though. Okay. Um, because so after milking stops. Yeah. Yeah. So then, what do you do with them? You figure out what you want to do with them. Mm -hmm. um, they, because they say after eight years. Um, what will we'll kill them would be kidding. Just because they're a little tired. I think sometimes there, there's physiological changes. But so we'll milk for eight years and then retire them. The initial goats that we have, they have a lifetime pension. So okay. when they're done, they live on the farm. The other ones will sell or butcher. So what would you sell an older goat? Who would you sell that to? Someone who wanted the meat. Oh, okay. or, or a companion or a brush clearing animal. Right. A lot of our, the live animals we sell are for brush clearing. Huh. People will buy them. Um, do, they, the um, do they like to eat like thorny plants like uh, oh, yeah. flower yes. like, They love they it. Do. They love it. <laughs> it's amazing to watch them eat thistle. That's like, just when you get down, I mean, how they, I know, just eat the whole thing. So they don't mind eating the thorny stuff? No, they they, they love this. Oh, oh yeah, they eat yeah. Maybe it's like spicy for them. It's like, ooh, that's kind of quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poison ivy. Yeah. Oh, they want to tear into poison ivy like crazy. Right. It's like, ooh, this is a special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they do do a good job playing brush. I've got two weathers for no other purpose other than keeping stuff down. Yeah. And and when they come out of the pen, that's the first thing they hit is that poison ivy. Uh -huh. It's like, oh, boy. Yeah. And you kind of have to say, all right, guys, come on. Let's move you off here. That's how we get poison ivy. It's from moving them, you know, grabbing them, yeah. and they'll have over because they're always in it. Yeah. yeah. So when you do sell them, what's generally who who buys them? Like regionally, or is it more you guys call out, say Illinois or somewhere in other states, to bring in to buy those those ones that oh, you know? Oh, we buy our animals from? No, no. When oh, you who buys when, our animals? Yeah. Who, when you're done with your. <coughs> it's like there was somebody from Illinois last year who bought some. Um, we just put them on Craigslist, so it's, yeah, I say regionally. Okay. We've had people, some people from pretty far. We generally, because better focus, raise pretty healthy animals, so we, word has gotten out mm -hmm. among people that they'll say, oh, I got animals from X, Y, and Z, and they all died years lived. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell a friend, and they'll buy. Um, just as we make sure they get colostrum. The ones we're going to sell, we, mm -hmm. um, usually those have twins or triplets. We'll leave one with the... Uh, one with the dam and then pull the other two or three. Make sure they get colostrum. Mm -hmm. According to AWU, we have to keep them on farm for seven days. So we'll keep them at least seven days. They get just goat's milk. So we're taking a loss there. But we sell them pretty, our prices are pretty high. Yeah. We sell them that we both kids for. So that's fairly profitable. Um, <coughs> but yeah, I don't know if that market holds. 4-H, you buy for 4-H. People buy from us specifically because we keep a closed herd, so we're not moving our animals around. Mm -hmm. and so we know that the likelihood of disease is minimal. Yeah, there's some to the farm to buy to take them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, there's certain goat disease. Like, she, she, did she get CAE? Maybe that's no, cat rind. Cat rind would be no. So yeah, I thought she still got it though. It's similar to scrapey. Um, it's pretty much eradicated in the United States right now. Okay. Yeah. And CL. Is a goat 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 goat. Goat. That's what's holding it back right now, goats. So, yeah, and ours have tested negative for that. So those are just things like that, I think, um, enable sales. Um, we're tech, again, with AWA, we're not allowed to take animals to an auction. So they do make exceptions if it's the only, light, only way. So we really try to sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 4-H, uh, people family, for family milkers, some other dairies, brush clearing. Companion animals for horses, that's a kind of, <laughs> kind of thing to provide for. They make great pets. <laughs> and what breeds do you have? We have the Alpines. Um, so the black and white and all black, and the brown with the black stripe are Alpines. And I don't know if you can see the all brown ones. Those are Tagenbergs. Um, so I've got, it's a one good picture of, oh, there. The two all brown ones in the bottom left. Those are Tigerbergs, the rest are Alpines. Um, 
they're generally very similar. Alpines produce a little bit more milk. Tigerbergs are supposed to have a stronger tasting milk. I've never noticed a difference. But they're, they're dairy breeds. I would recommend Alpines. I just think they, they uh, Tigerbergs have a little bit of trouble in the heat. Their production drops mm -hmm. and they pant and seem to, they don't graze as efficiently in July and August. Uh, that one in the foreground looks like part of She's had Nubians, yeah. <laughs> and I would not recommend getting Nubians. Kale can uh, attest to that. They're great goats, but they're really loud uh, because of the no they scream. Oh. <laughs> they, they have really high butterfat content. Yeah. So the milk's really good, but. It's not, it's, not, it's not worth it. Just buy butter and put it in your mouth. They're kind of jumpy, like they're they're She's fighting. She's really skittish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Alpines I think are great. A great breed. Goat calls can sound kind of human like, so it can be really disconcerting. A great Brian has a uh, Katahdin sheep. Those are good livestock, I think, too, on a, a brushier farm. Yeah, they, they, uh, they, they'll do the same thing. They'll, they'll uh -huh. climb trees uh, because they're, uh, they're a cross of um, a Caribbean and African. So they're a-seasonal a as well, so they're, they'll, they'll go up. You know, they're tremendous grazers, uh, but we're doing the same thing. We uh, Whereas our flock started getting bigger, uh, we started running into losses during the summer because of the heat. So what we, we did was we, um, to manage our pastures, we started um, putting a, a wood line, a, a wooded area with every pasture. So it meant cutting trails to be able to fence that in. And the sheep just have done a phenomenal job. But I am thinking about a couple goats to, to run to get some things that the sheep just don't, just don't, you know, go to. What would that be? What would they? What do the sheep not like to eat? Uh, there's uh, the, the 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 thistle. They'll they'll eat the thistle, uh -huh. particularly the lambs. I find lambs well, um, but the older ones won't. Yeah. Um, and the only way that you can get thistle down is you have to overgraze it. Yeah. And I won't do that. So that's what I was thinking about as well. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to ask you about this is that we're having a problem right now, as a lot of people are, is with horse nettle. Uh -huh. And so I didn't know if goats would, would be good for horse nettle because it's sheep toxic. Is toxic. Yeah, They'll sheep, eat it though. Yeah, sheep won't, eat, <laughs> won't even touch the horse nettle. Oh, they love the yeah. seed pods. Oh, do they? So we eliminated it pretty much because they ate it all. Yeah, we haven't had any problems. Yeah, because I, I mean, I can't get. I can't, I can't buy a bale. Without it? Without oh, it. Oh, I have it all over my hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so. They, uh, it's funny, it, where we have, it's a, what about that tall, I'd say? Yeah. And it gets a, like, a, almost like a cherry tomato. It's like a wild nightshade. It looks like Yeah, a it is in the tomato family. Is it to, yeah, it has that, and you'll see here, crunch, 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 and they're just eating the seed pots, picking them out. So that really, that's almost eliminated it, because, uh, take care of it. It's interesting. Yeah, because I, I, I took the, um, a, um, a swing blade uh -huh. and a bungee to my ATV. So after I finish grazing the pasture, then I take the swing blade and I just go out there and I get rid of the noxious stuff. But the horse metal, right? What I found was when it grew up straight, I come and I get it, and the next thing you know, it starts going across yeah, the ground. It's, smart. <laughs> it's, it's like you just need some potato beetles. I'll bring you some potatoes. <laughs> 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 Initially, when we, when we had the goats out, there was horse nettle, um, dog bane, which is another toxic plant. They love um, that. Yeah, they love it. And we, I, we were all freaked out, pulling that stuff, and it, was, it all worked out. out. They killed almost all the toxic things. And what about cherry trees? Yeah, I cut cherry trees down in the winter. But they're not... Uh, oh, that'll kill for them. Cat, it will kill them. Yeah, so I cut them down okay. in the winter when, when they're not leafed out. They're not six black cherry trees. trees. Okay. Because we were told the same, but I've seen my sheep get up in the cherries, eat the leaves, and... Uh, they can yeah. eat them green. Yeah. yeah. It's when they're wilted. Okay. And I've just been told it'll kill them, it'll kill them fast. Right. I don't right. know why. But yeah, so that, that will, I will yeah. remove. What about, do you, 
um, debug your <laughs> No, um, there, I think they all point that picture. Um, no, we had initially were going to, because um, I'd done, done it on cattle farms, but um, we just decided not to, I mean, the horns serve a purpose. Yeah. Um, they're not, it's not a big problem because one advantage of goats too is they're small and they're easy to handle. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't want them standing here, you just move them. Um, so it's, it's not really a danger. Um, they act as good radiators in the summer on the ground. They're warm, even in the winter now, because they're really vascular. So they're going to dissipate heat, just like big ears and animal right. in the desert. And goats are constantly bashing heads. I don't know about your sheep. They have this really interesting social hierarchy. And so just nonstop. And the ones that don't have horns, like you can hear their skulls crush. Uh, so they act as bumpers. Right. So we've had to do some modifications, like all our, our hay feeders. We can't use what a lot of people use as cattle panel, but they'll get their heads stuck. Okay. So we we'll use and um, electric fencing, they won't get their heads stuck. But woven wire fencing, they'll get their heads stuck. The animal welfare approved doesn't allow this budding anyway, right? They do. They do allow it. Yeah. It's discouraged. Oh, yeah. That's what they say. They said if you can prove, like, <coughs> some specific reason mm -hmm. how to do it, but yeah, it's simple to do and it's not hard. It's not long term. Does no long term damage to the animal. Right. But we just figure they have horns on it. But, yeah. Believe them. Let them yeah. express their horns. Yeah, and they're beautiful. I mean, it's nice to look out there and see animals with these big. And the bucks, they have, I don't know if you the bucks, but just giant, giant mm -hmm. horns, which are coming handy when, uh, during breeding season. Yeah, the handles. Having handles. Oh. So just kind of <laughs> grab the bucks. Because the way we do our breeding is, um, which is probably different than how Brian, how you do it on a, a meat operation, is we breed a spit. Each goat individually. I don't just turn the bucks in. Bucks are always separate from the does. <coughs> they have their separate rotation, they have their separate barn. And <coughs> when a doe comes into heat, we'll pick out that the buck we want to breed her with. They'll go out on a date for a couple hours, and then buck goes back reluctantly. <laughs> and the doe, doe goes with her with their friends. And that way we know exactly when when they're gonna kid. Because right. I want to be present for every kidding. Um, and there, I don't know, people say but the buck odor contains the milk. Yeah. I don't know, because our bucks aren't, aren't around them. So who does all the paperwork? That, that, that's one question, and, yeah. and we've had this question for two weeks now. Which is better for you, uh, a Facebook or, or a website? Or do you, don't you have both? Or? No. Oh, as far as the paperwork? Keeping all the records. I don't know, probably both of us. I don't know. Everything is just on ledgers, pretty much. Um, so try to be as simple as possible. I know one we talked about QuickBooks. I know we use that just paper. And we have a Facebook page, a business Facebook page, and a business website. Um, I would say the Facebook page is good because, like, what we talk about the market is we can <coughs> say, like, oh, this week we have cross We have caramel. Uh, available this week, and then the, the farmers market will share that, and it'll be like a thousand. And then people, it actually, I know it works because people come to the market and say, Oh, I saw your Facebook post. My wife sent me to get. Oh, yeah, my wife sent me to get this or that. We get that a lot. Um, and it's about the same answer we've heard every week. Yeah. That Facebook is much more productive for you in sales than having a, a web page. I think so. Well, Facebook goes out to people. Whereas a website, I'd have to come to, to whatever yeah, your right. URL is. Exactly. Instead, I just have to like you once and you show up every day. Yeah. That's how what a website does do is got a lot of photo journalism students now. <laughs> 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 they all the projects and. Yeah. But I would say the Facebook page has been more beneficial. Yeah, yeah. I, for myself, I know Friday and Saturday morning, you're going to get all the people at the farmers market. You're going to kick in. You know, Judy yeah. Jenkinson's going to be there, you're going to be there, you're going to be there. Uh -huh. uh, John Budapest is going to come in. Yeah.